Uh, today's lecture on the digestive system. So the goal of digestion is to provide nourishment and whole food when it's ingested in the chemical form it's it's not in the form that you can absorb. So digestion facilitate absorption, the, the GI tract digests food by both mechanical and chemical processes. And here's an overview of the main functions of the digestive system. I frequently call it the, the GI tract. It's simply a tube from mouth to anus and along the way you secrete things into the digestive tract to facilitate digestion and uh, the process can be understood by defining these terms ingestion stick it in your mouth insert into oral cavity that's all that means and Mechanical digestion refers to the physical pummeling of food. Mechanical digestion. Food gets a physical pummeling. That's accomplished largely by the oral cavity because of your teeth or their chompers chew. When you chew your food, the, well, the anatomy word for that is mastication. You swallow your food and the stomach does a bit of a mechanical digestion because of the stomach churning. It mixes the food up quite nicely. Those are primarily the main two spots in mechanical digestion. And propulsion refers to the fact that you're moving food always in one direction toward the rectum anus. So that's why they put propulsion starting from the mouth all the way, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, all the way down there. And it's accomplished by this rhythmic movement of smooth muscle, rhythmic contraction of smooth muscle, and we call that the peristalsis, and that's the terminal right here. Peristalsis refers to a rhythmic contraction of smooth muscle. This, this accomplishes the propulsion. propulsion of food towards rectum anus. Okay, and uh, well, well, we'll look at those smooth muscle layers when we study the, the GI tract wall. Uh, moving on, chemical digestion is different from mechanical digestion. The definition of chemical is to um, break the food down at the molecular level by enzymes. So think of the three major food stuffs, carb, protein, fat. The carb, CHO, you're going to break down starches into simple sugars like glucose, you know. Starch would be the polymer, break it down to simple sugars. 
there's the proteins, that's the polymer, just break it down to the building blocks of amino acids. And for fats, um, think of triglycerides, TGs. You break those down into glycerol and fatty acids. Free fatty acids. Um, the fatty acid is the molecule that can enter the muscle cell to metabolize for energy. What's the job of the digestive system? To secrete enzymes into the digestive tract to kind of break all these food stuffs down and um, it happens, well it actually starts in the mouth. Chemical digestion occurs in the mouth because of the salivary amylase which breaks down starches. So oral cavity begins because you got the salivary amylase. That's an enzyme that breaks down starch. Now, we'll look at the salivary glands later. It's just an overview. You get a lot of chemical digestion in the stomach. The stomach has these gastric glands. And those gastric glands secrete things like HCL and pepsin. Pepsin like will break those peptide bonds of the uh, proteins. HCL is a, is a standard good chemical um, dissolver of most things. In the small intestine, They put the most acid drops right there in the first part. The first part of the small intestine is called the duodenum. And the duodenum will receive the, the, di the digestive juices of liver and pancreas. Duodenum receives juices of liver, slash pancreas. Okay, then we'll, we'll a lot, I'll have a lot of notes on liver and pancreas later and what those juices are. But they accomplish a lot of uh, chemical digestion. Now, all along the length of the small intestine, there's what are called brush border enzymes to finish off the chemical digestion. Okay, it's the main job of the, the small intestine for absorption of food. But if any digestion is left to be done, the brush border enzymes of the rest of the small intestine, I'll just list them here, brush border enzymes, finish off, finish off chemical digestion. So imagine you have um, epithelial cells with the microvilli lining the small intestine. Draw a couple of cells. The brush border enzymes exist in this microvilli portion, which appears like a brush border. So like they're all embedded in the cell membrane. And they can help finish off digestion. Now, so um, the goal of digestion is absorption. I mean, if it passes right through you, which some things do, and that's good to clean out your colon, but uh, the idea of absorption is you pass from the GI tract into either the intestinal capillary or lymphatic vessel. So the um, chemical digestion finishes digestion. Now you're going to absorb it. That's really the goal. The 
absorption of the foods, nutrition. It's primarily um, intestinal capillaries. They absorb most things. Fat globules are a little too big to get into the intestinal capillary wall, so lacteals can absorb them. So um, lacteals, that's a lymphatic structure. Okay, lacteal, they absorb fat. Intestinal capillaries, everything else. And um, this is primarily the small intestine. The large intestine, there's not much left to absorb. Maybe water and fat-soluble vitamins. Colon or large intestine absorbs water, fat-soluble vitamins. You absorb the water, you compact the feces. Um, you're done with digestion. Defecation isn't part of the digestive process. It's you're done when you've absorbed the nutrients. Defecation is just eliminating what was not absorbed. So what happens is um, compact feces. You move it towards the rectum. The rectum is simply a storage chamber for the feces. As it compacts in there, the rectal walls distend. That means stretch. And it causes a reflex where when you stretch the walls, it reacts by contracting. So they distend, then in response they rectal walls contract. And that contraction, it moves the feces towards the anal canal. And that's when you feel the urge to go. The anal canal has um, sphincters around it, and that's kind of when you, you maybe decide, okay, am I, am I gonna go now or later? That's, the urge to, to go to eliminate the wastes. So that's an overview of the, the, the major functions of digestion. It also helps to understand um, the general structure of the GI tract. And they show you a bit of a tube that's cut. The thing about the digestive tract is it looks different depending on where you are in the body. For example, when we study the histology, we're going to study it in four places. I'll show you the digestive tract wall, the GI tract wall, in the esophagus, stomach, small intestine, and the large intestine. And you have to be able to know where you are in the GI tract just based on looking at the, the wall structure. And so it helps to understand the, well, the general pattern of the GI tract structure. I'll tell you the clues of how to tell where you are in the GI tract later. Well, the space for food to pass by is the lumen of this uh, cut tube, and it's shown right in the middle. And there's no, they're not showing any food in there, but that's where the food passes through the lumen. We're, we're studying the layers of the wall, going from inner to outer. Let's start with the innermost layer, uh, the mucosa. The mucosa is lined with an epithelium. The epithelium will, will change throughout the digestive tract depending on its function. If the function is protection, then you want a stratified squamous epithelium.
example, we're going to see that in the esophagus. If the function is absorption secretion, you're going to see a columnar epithelium. And we basically see that everywhere else. Columnar ET everywhere else. There's a different function. Although the point is it changes depending on the function. Oh, anyways, on the picture, the epithelium, it's lining the lumen. It's the innermost layer there. And it's surrounded by a <coughs> propria, which is a connective tissue. It's like a basement membrane. And that lamina appropriate is surrounded by a muscle layer called the muscularis mucosa. That muscularis mucosa is shown right here. It's a confusing thing for students because we don't usually see a muscle layer in a mucosal layer, but the digestive system has one. So always look for it. It's um, helpful to have this muscle layer on the innermost mucosa layer because it helps increase the agitation of food. Helps mix it up, increase agitation of food. You know, you'll mix it up better. You'll mix it with the enzymes. You'll improve digestion. So that's an important structure. So epithelium, lamina propria, muscularis mucosa. Then you're surrounded by a connective tissue layer, just called the submucosa. And it's just, there's a bunch of stuff in there. Let's just call it submucosa. I'm leaving a gap between mucosa and submucosa because there's something that they call malt. And they put it right there in the lamina propria, but this thing, it really invades the submucosa as well as the mucosa. So I'm going to put malt in between mucosa and submucosa. I already taught it. It stands for mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue. So it's a structure. It's kind of between these layers. The submucosa is simply a, uh, a loose connective tissue, a loose CT. It does contain structures like these glands in the submucosa. The ones you got to know that I always have you identify on models or histology slides are called the Bruner's glands. So that's a structure I'll list within the submucosa. It's Bruner's glands spelled Brunner's. And the place we're going to look at them is only in the duodenum. The duodenum is the first 10 centimeters of small intestine. The small intestine is 21 feet long. The first 10 inches or so is the duodenum. And it's right after the stomach. So it's receiving the acidic chyme from the stomach. And so the Brunner's glands will secrete an alkaline fluid to neutralize stomach acid. That's the function. Alkaline. Secretion neutralizes stomach acid. If you see any yellow lines modeled in the submucosa, like right there or right there. Uh, call that the submucosal plexus. So I'll list it under submucosa, submucosal plexus. It's a plexus of nerves. Okay, well, the submucosa is surrounded by a muscle layer called the muscularis externa. This is the true muscle layer that executes the peristalsis. Mm 
muscularis externa. It's bilayer in most parts. That inner layer, the smooth muscle cells, this is smooth muscle, by the way. It's arranged in a circle. Okay, it's a kind of a running circular. They run circularly around the lumen. So when they contract, they, they squeeze. That'll help push food forward. The outer longitudinal layer, because it runs lengthwise, it'll kind of like shrink. So it's like you squeeze and then shrink, and that helps push food forward. So anyways, be able to identify this inner, I'll put inner in parentheses, that's not part of the name, but it always helps me remember which one's which. The inner layer is the circular layer. The outer layer is longitudinal. And you always have to put of muscularis externa. Of muscularis externa. Just to be complete in naming it, circular doesn't name anything. What's circular? And you don't want to confuse the muscularis externa with muscularis mucosa. So it's important to write the whole thing out. Sandwiched between those two layers are the nerve plexus called the myenteric plexus. So whenever you see yellow nerve fibers illustrated between the muscle layers, call it myenteric plexus. As a side note, something you should know. My enteric and submucosal plexuses they kind of um, form what's called the enteric nervous system. It's the lesser taught nervous system in A and P. In we teach more autonomic and somatic, that's fine, but I at least want to give mention to it. This is like a, call it, call it mini brain. It accomplishes digestion without you thinking about it. You just, all you do is chew and swallow. Everything else is autopilot, and it's the enteric nervous system. All right, so that's pretty much it. Now this outer wrapping, the outermost layer, it's called serosa or adventitia. We put that as kind of like the last layer. The outermost layer, serosa, or sometimes you can call it, I see it called adventitia. What's well, a serous membrane? That's why it's called serosa. It's, um, it's wrapping the whole thing. And look how it forms mesenteries. It's the outermost layer. And uh, well, the mesentery is a conduit for nerve artery vein lymphatics. So it's kind of how every inch that I just subtract gets what it needs. There's a blood supply and innervation. So it's like um, if you have a digestive, a piece of digestive tube cut right there, the serosa would be the serous membrane that wraps it all up. But where the serosa kind of meets on the back, it's going to pinch and it's going to line the back body wall. So if the black line is the back body wall of your peritoneal cavity, the lining of the back body wall is called the parietal peritoneum. Okay, it, it makes um, the insides of your body cavity uh, fluid filled, sterile and fluid filled, parietal. And if 
fat serosa wraps an organ. That's called the visceral peritoneum. And where it's pinched and forms a double peritoneum, that, that's mesentery. continue this down here. Let's say you have an organ or part of the digestive tract. It's actually behind that serosal layer. Some more terms. Um, you call these organs whatever they are, just hypothetical, we call retroperitoneal. They're behind the body wall. They're, the, they're behind that serosal layer. Retroperitoneal. So if something is in the body cavity, it's not behind it, it's, it's intraperitoneal. Some more terms. Okay, so you know, mesentery, intra, retro, in the body cavity. It's kind of like if like I was like stuck to the wall and you put a big piece of like saran wrap over me from head to toe and you could see me through the saran wrap. I'm retroperitoneal against the chalkboard there. It's kind of what organs look like when you kind of see them through with that serous membrane just anchored on the back body wall there. This next slide is showing you my enteric and submucosal plexuses being the ENS, I already mentioned that. This slide is showing you a model we have in the room. It's numbered and labeled. Um, I think you should be able to identify all these things. I think we covered it all. Well, I got the, uh, the layers, right, from top to bottom, mucosa, submucosa, muscularis externa serosa. And this happens to be small intestine. And what you're seeing there is that the mucosa is arranged into these things that stick up in these little pits. So it's kind of like, uh, okay, like so, you stick up, that's a villi. It goes down, pit, villi, pit, villi, pit. You call the pits intestinal crypt. You call the things that stick up for absorption the villi, villus, or singular. The villus, by sticking up, you're, you're like these little finger-like projections, you're increasing the absorptive area of the small intestine. So that's how the mucosa is arranged. So that, would that be number 15, the intestinal mucosa? Yes, 15 is the crypt, and then the thing that stick up, number one. Number two is a lacteal, and it's surrounded by an intestinal capillary. Now, it's not labeled there. They kind of label it with number three. Four is pointing to the gray area. The epithelium is over number four. Number four is lamina propria. Where's number five? I don't see it. Number nine is pointing to the muscularis mucosa. That's kind of like the bottom of the mucosa. Um, from here to here is submucosa. That makes number 10 the, Br the Bruner's glands. Number 11 is malt. Number seven is pointing to these yellow nerves. That's submucosal plexus. So then 13, those yellow lines, is the myoteric plexus. So 12 A and B is the bilayer muscularis externa, circular longitudinal. And then you have serosa down here. And I guess number 14 is pointing to it. You have other models that show the layers. Mucosa, submucosa, muscularis externa, circular layer, longitudinal layer. 
and serosa. Also on the uh, small intestine, well, that's small intestine, but also on the large intestine, same layering. So I, it's that little dissection right there. Because the submucosa, the circular layer, the longitudinal layer is different for the large intestine. It's a simple band. It's not a complete layer all the way around. And then 11 is the serosa. So those layers are shown on some of the models. The mesentery pictures I have, um, it's a fused double wall of peritoneum. And um, viewing from a, a, a transverse section, I kind of, what I did was more of a sagittal section, I guess. But the idea is, if the uh, serous membrane covers an organ, that's this real peritoneum. If it lines the body cavity, parietal peritoneum. And where it's a double pinching of membrane, just call it mesentery. And remember, if it's behind the body wall, that's retro peritoneum versus things that are intra. Okay, now some of these mesenteries, I do want you to know, and they're labeled here, it might help to kind of draw that out. Here's a sagittal view. And what you got there at the top is um, we'll draw some of the intraperitoneal organs. We have the liver. Right below that, you have a sectional view of the stomach. and then the transverse colon. Stomach, transverse colon. And then below that, um, they draw a bunch of cut tubes. The jejunum and ileum are the majority of the small intestine right here. That's enough. So I'll just call that small intestine. And they give you a couple of retroperitoneal organs, the, the pancreas behind the stomach, and they give the duodenum behind the transverse colon. So we'll go with that for pancreas, and then the anatomy here. Behind the transverse colon, you have a piece of the small intestine called the duodenum. So the, uh, the peritoneum that lines the body cavity, let's say for example, I'll just start it here. It's called the parietal peritoneum as we said before. It's going to line the bottom of the diaphragm. It's going to shoot down on top of the liver and cover it. shoots down to line the front body wall there. Notice the liver has a little bald spot that's not covered by peritoneum. They literally call that the bare area of the liver. 
right? Right there. Bare area uh, covered with peritoneum, a bald spot. And um, well, okay, the liver is completely covered with peritoneum, but then there's a part that shoots down from liver to stomach. It covers the stomach. And that little piece of mesentery is the lesser omentum. You gotta know that. from liver, stomach. So, in the drawing, you kind of see it there, lesser omentum. And then from stomach, there's this big double fat apron that goes from stomach to transverse colon. And that fat apron is the greater omentum. A lot of fat depot there. So, let's see, so from stomach, So this is greater momentum. It's in the front. I mean, you take off your ab wall, and that's the first thing I see. Uh, okay, well, anyways, getting back to the transverse colon there, it's anchored to the back body wall right there. Well, anyways, this meso, uh, mesentery, mesentery is called uh, the transverse mesocolon. It anchors the transverse colon to the back body wall. Transverse mesocolon. All right, let's continue on here. Um, there's something called the root of the mesentery. It's going to help wrap all of the small intestines in, in peritoneum. So this root of the mesentery, root of the mesentery, it's anchoring the intestines to the back body wall. So let me just finish off the parietal peritoneal like that. So I, I take time to draw that out. You know, the models don't really show that very well. Uh, you really don't get a good sense of that until you start looking at cadavers. That, that, that day is coming. I have other pictures to help you uh, study those mesocolons and mesenteries. This is showing you greater and lesser momentum. The picture on the right is showing you a nice frontal view of stomach and liver. I open up the body cavity, the first thing I see, fat apron. That, that's the greater momentum. It, it gets its name because it's attached to the greater curvature of the stomach. That's the lesser omentum. That is the lesser curvature of the stomach. If you lift up the fat apron, let's remember that the uh, greater omentum, it goes from stomach to transverse colon. So if you lift up the greater omentum, you expect to see the transverse colon underneath it. And there's the transverse mesocolon behind that. So, greater momentum, transverse mesocolon. So, the, the pointing to it in both locations. And there's a model we have in the room. There's the transverse colon. There's the transverse mesocolon. It's not labeled, but what do you think that is? The fat apron. Greater momentum.
There's the wadnum. There's pancreas, so we'll get to that. Um, let's do a survey of the GI tract. Basically, what I do is I start with all the details going from oral cavity mouth all the way to the end. Okay. And so the oral cavity is uh, shown here, kind of the dentist view. And I don't have too many terms there, just oral cavity proper, your mouth and uh, oral vestibule. Well, to define this space, it's the uh, space between tongue and hard palate. A hard palate, basically the roof of your mouth. You can see the back of the mouth there, and you can see the fossies with the palatine tonsil. Remember that? The fossies, these folds right there. There's uvula hanging down. Fossil. You can see the palatine tonsils right back there. Okay. This space right there between lips and gums or cheeks and gums is, uh, well, it's the oral vestibule. between lips or cheeks and gums. The anatomy word for gums is gingiva. The anatomy word for lips is labrum. And for cheeks, it, it's buccal. Buccal refers to cheeks. Those terms are going to come up later. But anyways, it, it's like where you put a mouthpiece, right? That kind of space. The oral cavity, I, I want to stick to what helps in digestion. So I'm mainly going to focus on muscles that help you chew, the salivary glands, and teeth. Just the things <coughs> for digestion. The salivary glands, well, there's three of them shown here. You page numbers. You've got to be able to identify them. I think it's obvious the salivary glands secrete saliva. Saliva moistens, lubricates food. It does contain, like I said earlier, that, that salivary amylase. So saliva can either be watery with the amylase or it can be mucousy, full of mucins. And that helps lubricate the food. So saliva is a, is a combination, of, it's a combo water mucus secretion. And um, the salivary glands, well, I'll just list them on the board here. You've got the parotid salivary gland. I'll just put parotid, they're all salivary glands. And the parotid gland, it has a very, it had, of all these salivary glands, it has the longest duct. Of all of these glands, the ducts I may have you identify. Usually I just stick to the parotid duct because it's so long. You can see it right there. What it does is, um, this is the gland structure. You ever take your first bite of food and you feel a tingling by your ear there? That's a stimulation of the salivary gland. And you should know the innervation. That's cranial nerve 9. It 
it's a visceral motor function. Just remember, the duct, it pierces the buccinator muscle, and it empties in uh, near your upper jaw by the second molar up there. Okay, we can't see that from this view, but uh, know that the sub subvandibular uh, salivary gland, they have, um, I guess, medium length ducts. And the innervation is not nine, but seven, cranial nerve seven. Medium length ducts. And right under your tongue, sublingual. Stand in the mirror, lift up your tongue, and look underneath your tongue, you'll see like little saliva accumulate there. It's, well, that's the sublingual. Also innervated by seven. They have the shortest duct lengths, the shortest ducts. And uh, there, there's a reason I'm telling you the duct length, long, medium, short. It has to do with what the what the glands secrete. Turns out saliva, this lubricating digestive fluid, there are serous cells in some of these salivary glands. They're the ones that secrete the watery fluid with the amylase. Because amylase is a protein, and well, those cells usually take up a dark stain. And the other cells are mucus cells. They stain light because mucins don't take up a stain. So you can kind of tell what you're looking at based on the histology of how the cells are staining light or dark. Turns out, if, um, if you secrete a watery substance, it travels well down the duct. However, a mucus secretion would not travel well down the duct. It would get clogged up. So the mucus secretions, they need a shorter duct. And the watery uh, secretions can have a longer duct. So this um, histology of the glandular tissue that stains mostly dark is almost totally serous, and that's the parotid gland. It's got the longest duct. Totally serous. So the medium duct length, there's some light and dark, right? So it's kind of like that's why it's an in-between length. Serous as well as mucus. And then sublingual has the shortest duct lanes, and they're almost totally mucus, mostly mucus. So know that histology, just based on light and dark. You can determine duct length, you can determine which gland it is. Uh, the muscles of mastication include, well, there's a lot of them. I'm going to give you two. Temporalis masseter. Okay, so the goal is chewing. These two big muscles help you close your mouth, close the jaw. Two muscles of mastication. They're both innervated by the third branch of cranial nerve five, so we call it D3. Well, the name is mandibular division, D3 for short. Okay, you gotta know temporalis master, those are the muscles.
Just identify them, know their innervation. Well, know their action. They close the jaw. That's not so hard. I won't ask you attachments, though. Well, there's the innervation. Um, so let's look at cranial nerve 5, the third branch. Here's the trigeminal nerve. It's given off three branches. There's the third one. You can see it gives off all these other branches. Well, it's going to innervate those two muscles of mastication, temporalis and masseter. OK, and then the teeth. So when you close your jaw, you've got to have teeth in there. And you have upper jaw and lower jaw. You've got 32 teeth in the uh, fully grown adult mouth. You're not going to really teach the baby teeth. Baby teeth, 20. Adult teeth, 32. So you can see the innervation there. Obviously, you can, you can feel it when you got a toothache, so you know there's innervation. Uh, V2, that's the maxillary division. That's for the upper jaw, maxillary teeth, as we call it. 32 adult teeth, 16 in the upper jaw. Well, you should say maxillary teeth. That's the maxillary division, V2. The lower jaw, the mandible, mandibular teeth. Well, again, that's V3. If you just think of it as 16 and 16, even break it down into 8, 8, 8, and 8. Four sets of 8. In a set of eight, in a set, you have two incisors, that's your front teeth. Those are for cutting and tearing, those aren't for chewing. Okay, you cut and tear. You have your, your fangs. Canines, you got one, it's a cone shaped tooth. Canine, it's a cone, basically. You got two premolars, or, uh, well, they're also called bicuspids. A cusp is a cutting surface of the tooth. Those are for chewing. The two premolars, or three molars, the back teeth there, where you can see the picture. Three. Molars or tricuspids. So that's one set of eight, right? Two, three, four, five, six, yeah, that's it. That third molar, the backmost molar is, well, your wisdom teeth, right? Uh, which are commonly removed. If your jaw is growing and it's not growing, enough to accommodate that third molar on the x-ray, they can see it, it's going to impact the tooth in front of it, which be, will be very painful. So uh, they're surgically extracted before that can happen. Here's a picture of um, the innervation. Here's V2 going through the foramen rotunda. You can see there's all these little branches going down to innervate upper jaw teeth. This branch right there um, of V3, it's called the inferior alveolar nerve, and it runs in the mandibular canal. Uh, that's one you got to know it's for the lower jaw. So it's a branch of V3, inferior alveolar nerve. It's, well, it's not a nice picture of it, so it's a nice big branch to innervate a set of eight in the lower jaw on either side. So if you ever need dental work, hopefully it's the lower jaw because you just have one thing to block, right? If it's a tooth in the upper jaw, there's not one big branch you can block, so you may need more injections to make sure you're all numbed up. If you look at the sides of the tooth, they kind of give you these four boundaries mesial, distal, palatal, or buccal. So it's kind of like uh,
So based on this quadrant of eight, you can see the midline. If it's closer to the midline, they call that mesial. So side opposite would be distal. If it's the side that faces the inside of your mouth, they call that palatal. If it's the side that faces the cheek or the gum, it's going to be the labial or buccal side of the tooth. <clears throat> depending on if it's a front tooth or a back molar, right? So you have the sides of the tooth, as well as um, knowing when they erupt or fall out. Now, I don't expect you to know this for a test, but just to give you a rough idea. See, I'm not teaching the baby teeth, which are the deciduous teeth, because they fall out. That's what that means. It's just like, remember the decidua basalis? It falls off. So the baby teeth, they erupt in months, you know, six to eight months, eight to ten months. The second molars come out last. Baby teeth, you got 20 of them. And they fall out about in years, about first grade, all the way through maybe sixth grade, junior high. And you know, that's when your adult teeth come in. The incisors come out first, eruption in years, first grade, you know, second, third grade. The last teeth to come out are your wisdom teeth, the third molar. And they give you a big range there. It's, it's variable. And like I said, um, well, for example, I've had all of my wisdom teeth removed. So when I say all, how many is that? Four. So based on the coding, which teeth am I missing? One and 32. 16 and 17. They're, they're gone. So how many teeth do I have? 28. 28. And I've even counted them. I got 28, I just to make sure. Like, well, I got 28 teeth now. Uh, well, when you extract the tooth, you don't renumber. You just kind of skip it, right? So I'm missing 1, 32, 16, 17. So I start at 2, right? Um, so they're just numbered. Now, baby teeth, they use letters. But um, we're just doing adults, so just know that in the, in the adult mouth, you number it. If you look at the structure of a tooth, uh, well, you got these terms, crown, neck, and root, we define that. Is anyone going into dental hygiene? Some people. Well, structure of a tooth. Okay, crown. This is the part that's erupted above the, the gum line. Okay. You can see your teeth. This is what we call our teeth. You, you can see this part. Well, the neck is at the, the, the tooth gum margin. That's the neck. That's where you floss. And the part that's anchored in the alveolar bone, that's the root of the tooth, the part you can't see. Tooth anchored in alveolar bone. by periodontal ligaments. Well, ligaments form joints. This joint is a, is a gonthosis type of a joint, which means bolted condition. Your teeth are bolted into these sockets. tooth is sectioned all the way open so we can see all the hard tissue. Think of the, the tissue of a tooth 
in terms of how much is it mineralized. I mean, obviously your teeth are mineralized, hard, very dense tissue. It's, it's the densest tissue in the body. It's more dense than bone. Well, the enamel is anyway, so. Enamel, as you can see from the picture, it lines the crown. Okay, you got so many millimeters of enamel, and hopefully it lasts your whole life. If you grind it away, you can't get it back. It doesn't regrow. So enamel is 96% mineralized. It's very tough. Just to give you a rough idea, I mean, bone is roughly 50 to 60% mineralized. So this is like, well, way above that. And, well, most of tooth is dentin from crown to root, dentin. Dentin is about 70% mineralized. In the root of a tooth, you have something called cementum. It's only in the root there. Cementum is a tissue that's more bone-like. It's about 50% mineralized. And then um, in the very center, you have the pulp chamber. And that's not mineralized at all. It's soft tissue. And that's where you have you know, nerve artery. You have the blood supply and you have the nerve. Chamber. Soft tissue, basically. You got the nerve. Well, you know it's there when you got a toothache, right? The nerve. You got the blood supply. Well, a cavity. At some point in our life, we've probably had a cavity at some point. It's an erosion of those um, mineralized tissues. Like, for example, if it doesn't get too deep, you should get a filling to fill that first one. It erodes through uh, enamel and dentin. And you want to get to it before it gets to the pulp chamber. If it gets all the way down to the pulp chamber, you're going to have a toothache. And then you'll be desperate to go to the doctor. You can decide if you want to save the tooth or extract it altogether. If you want to save the tooth, there's an abscess down there because it's infected. Um, they, they do a series of drillings, and then they excavate the pulp chamber. The only thing they leave is the blood supply. But they get rid of the nerves so your toothache goes away. And then, you, you, so if you do the root canal, you excavate this whole soft tissue from the um, pulp chamber, and then you cap it. You get a crown. Probably a second appointment. All right, so chew, swallow, that's esophagus. So that's kind of the next structure. I want to move away from oral cavity and talk about swallowing. Now, a picture of swallowing is not very much fun to look at. I've got a little YouTube clip here. Let's take a look at this. Bearing swallow and chewing, chewing, look at the soft palate, how much it moves. You see it go down there? It's going down the esophagus. There's the kind of, there's the hyoid, this is the voice box right there. So it's in front of the food tube, it's kind of freaking out. Imagine if this was you looking at yourself swallow, you'd, you'd freak out. I know I would. Well, maybe you won't, I would. It's pretty interesting to see. Recording. There's a frontal view. Food going down the esophagus. There's different reasons you want to do a barium swallow. Maybe you think you have acid reflux, or maybe you have some kind of hernia in the stomach region. Video off. 
That's close to the stomach here. But anyways, I, give you, I just wanted to give you a rough idea of what, what it looks like to swallow x-ray vision. I'll talk more about esophagus when we get to the um, histology, but as you can see, it's in the chest cavity, the mediastinum. We saw it right behind the trachea when we looked at uh, the trachea earlier in the respiratory lectures. Um, let's take a look at the abdominal cavity, because that's kind of where we're going with digestion. To get the food down the esophagus, that's peristalsis. Segmentation refers to just mixing the food. Peristalsis refers to moving it in one direction. So those are different terms. But both are important for the digestive process. I would say esophagus, you just want the peristalsis, not so much segmentation. And once the food gets to the stomach, we're in the ab cavity. So the abdominal cavity, if you strip it down to muscle and bone, well, there's nothing to see there. But what you can see is the abdominal cavity in the front from xiphoid process all the way down to the uh, pubic bone there, it, it's a pretty wide margin. But when you follow the uh, rib cage down to the side, the distance between the hip bone and the side of the rib cage is not that much. I could feel the top of my rib cage there and there. It's only like this much. So in the front, the ab cavity is wide and it kind of narrows. So you go to the side there. I'm more interested in what's in the contents of the abdominal cavity. So if you look at the artery on this picture here, if you add the artery, it runs from the level of T12 all the way down to L4, where it splits in the common iliac arteries. So we're going to talk about the branches of the abdominal aorta more in this chapter. Uh, we, did, we kind of ignored it in the blood vessels chapter. Just mixing. It accomplishes mixing of food. Okay. Peristalsis accomplishes moving food forward. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So now the abdominal aorta, that's going right on the board. Let me add the vein to the picture. There's the, only the artery. Here's the artery next to the vein. These are both retroperitoneal, by the way. But the abdominal aorta, versus the inferior vein cava, I mean, they make it really easy for you, red, blue. Of course, in a real cadaver, it's not red, blue. One way I tell, which one's on the left, the artery or the vein? The artery. So aorta a little bit on the left, vena cava a little bit on the right. We say that the abdominal aorta runs from the level of T12 to L4. We talk about vessels in terms of the direction blood flows down in the aorta. But in the vena cava, up, right? It's got to go up to the heart for the venous return. And so basically that's running from the level of L5 all the way up to T8. Vena cava's a little bit longer, and it's on the right. Okay. So those are the main blood vessels in the abdominal cavity. So if you kind of like add everything back in. This is the view I see whenever I move the abdominal wall. Usually what I'll do is I'll cut along the rib cage along the costal margin all the way to the side and I'll just, just cut down and just reflect it down. You see the big fat apron? That's the greater momentum. What's this? Transverse colon. What do you think that is? Stomach. Stomach. What is that? Liver. And liver, and a little green 
sack. Gall bladder. That question? Oh, no. <laughs> Sometimes the gall bladder. <laughs> I remember one cadaver, um, I don't know what happened post-mortem, but this, not just that, the gallbladder is green. Sometimes I see the, all the organs on this side green. I've even seen it stain, all, I could see it green all the way through the skin green. Uh, so gallbladder really discolors every day. You know, I'm going to stop here. We'll pick it up with the stomach next time. Uh, when we come back from break, Thank <laughs> you.